Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. I'm Hank Hine, the Dali Museum Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this program now in its seventh year. Uh, Poetry at the Dali is uh, sponsored in part by the city of St. Petersburg, whose help we appreciate immensely. It is our tradition in this uh, program, curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace, to ask her to begin the program before she introduces the poets with a poem or two or three of her own. So let me introduce you now to the Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg, Florida, Helen Pruitt Wallace. Helen? Thank you so much, Hank. Um, uh, Hank is just a tremendous leader of the museum. We are so lucky to have him at the Dali. Um, and we are especially lucky tonight because we are asking him to also play his role as a poet. And he's a very fine, fine poet. And I was saying earlier um, to the other poets on this program that it's, it's tough to get him to be willing to, um, to, to share his, his work with us um, in the series, but we're very fortunate that he will tonight. Um, I want to add my thanks to the city for sponsoring the program and a special thanks to all the really great poets who've joined us um, here today. Um, as we all know, we've got the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up. And so it feels fitting to commemorate that um, through this Dolly program this evening. Um, so I will start by reading two poems um, and then I'll introduce the other poets. Um, and I've asked them to each read three poems, one of which may be written by another poet of their choosing, but all poems, um, those one poem at least will be a poem having to do with 9-11, the other two can be whatever they choose to read. Um, so first I'll read uh, Those Who Chose to Jump, The Twin Towers, 2001. Did you trace your children's names in ash, imagining their new class photos, the disheveled sweet wisps of hair? And did you, despite smoky fumes, smell again the coconut lathered on your back at the pool, your mother in a wide-brimmed hat, your sister sporting orange water wings, and you, age four, poised to attempt a perfect dive, your body leaning forward, toes curled around the hot tile. And there, reaching out toward all that blue, your father's arms. The next poem is after Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts. Auden's right about disaster the way it often finds us in the ordinary. I could duplicate the angle of the broom, the pattern of renegade dirt evading the pan, the smell of pop tarts burning in a toaster. Everyone you loved was busy living, checking email, cleaning gutters, slicing red tomatoes on a plate. Our days stack one by one upon such rituals, familiar acts that sh shim our fragile world, to something, if not balanced, almost holy. So how were we to know your last breath sent out like a good dog to fetch, wouldn't come back? Grief is too easily misperceived. Even now, the void you left could suck the churning sphere right down with it. At least jam phone lines and traffic, unleash a small monsoon meteor, perhaps it has catastrophes catapult daily. Who names the cause of chaos in the world? Your mother folds and folds the white sheets, but see how her corners don't line up. And your father out raking leaves, notice his grip on the rake, how tightly he tries to hold on while the leaves, the leaves keep falling. And over there, look, your black dog crazed for a buried bone. I now have the pleasure to introduce 
Sylvia Curbelo. Sylvia uh, was born in Montazas, Cuba, and immigrated to the US with her family as a child. She's the author of two full length, wonderful poetry collections, Falling Landscape and The Secret History of Water, both available from Anaheim to Press and two chapbooks. Awards include poetry fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Florida Division of Cultural Affairs, the CTES Foundation and the Writer's Voice, as well as the Jessica Noble Maxwell Memorial Poetry Prize from American Poetry Review. Her poems have been published widely in literary journals and more than three dozen anthologies, including Poems, Poets, and Poetry from Bedford St. Martin and the Northern Anthology of Latino Literature. And Sylvia was editor for Organica, a magazine of arts and activism for more than 20 years. She lives in Tampa. Welcome, Sylvia. It's great to have you join us. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Helen and uh, Hank for putting together this very important program and, and for inviting me to be a part of it. It's, it's truly an honor. And I'm also trying to wrap my head around the fact that it's, it's been 20 years since this horrific event that changed the way we look at the world forever. Um, so I'm going to open with a, a poem that I wrote uh, for 9-11. Um, I remember waking up very early the next morning and turning on the TV, as, as we all did in those days and watching this incredible scene of the sun rising over the rubble of the buildings. And oddly, it was the most spectacular sunrise. I remember reading somewhere that the, the more uh, pollution there is in the air, the light catches those particles and just creates this amazing colors. And so that was an irony that it was uh, such a beautiful scene. And as I watched the sun rising over the, the broken pieces of buildings, um, I imagine ordinary New Yorkers waking up and making coffee and just kind of trying to go about their day, uh, all the while knowing that nothing would ever be quite the same again. And so this poem is called Shine. The day seems strangely out of context, black and white as our hearts. We hated the smell of sunlight in the alleys, the ruined voices on TV. We couldn't read between the lines. We craved meaning and sleep, a hole swallowing a hole. Elsewhere, there were trees, there were sidewalks and food. We had music and cigarettes and cars, the ownership of light and noise, loneliness air, as if a boy had smashed open all the windows, as if the ashen sky meant rain and nothing more. At night, we saw dogs rooting in the shadows and men walking in the cold, their hands drifting out of warm pockets, reaching for what? Solace? A match? Imagine something shines in the dark and something moves towards that small brightness. Haven't you ever touched someone in just that way? So um, grief is a strange animal, uh, whether it's collective grief as in the case of 9-11 or a personal private grief. Um, you kind of have to remove yourself from the heart of the thing to understand what it is you're feeling. Um, usually it's just time and distance that helps you wrap your head around it. Um, when I was in my mid-twenties, my best friend's sister died unexpectedly. She was um, a year older than us, so we were all pretty close, and it was a truly shocking experience. Um, I was living in Florida by then and went back um, for the funeral to the small town in Iowa where I had lived when I was a, a teenager. Um, it was a, a very small farming community right in the middle of the state. I have very vivid memories of the days before and after the funeral, but there's one memory that particularly got really burned into my brain. Um, we just come back from the cemetery and my friend's dad was sitting on the front porch taking off his shoes 
very, very slowly, uh, deliberately, almost in slow motion, just removing one shoe, dropping it on the floor, removing the second shoe. And to me, it was as if this ordinary act carried all the grief and all the pain and all the exhaustion of the world. And um, I never forgot it. So for the next 10 years or so, I wrote several poems that tried to capture what I thought he might be feeling in that moment. And I don't believe I ever succeeded. Um, I'm not sure that anyone really can, but um, I think this poem came the closest and it's called The Simple Geography of Leaving. A man stands on his front porch hoping the crops don't freeze. It's the last leg of a bad season. He'd like to walk the feeling off. This is a story like the first wheel turning over. The house is dark. The wind climbs down. He moves from room to room. Every door is a hand around his heart. Looking into a mirror is a kind of leaving. He sees himself already coming back. His wife's soft breathing fills the air. The bed is still as a lake and cold. He could row himself out with his eyes closed. He walks out on the porch just as the first snowflakes hit the ground. Distance is like a stone beneath the water. The pieces keep floating up for years. And I would like to close with a poem I wrote for my mother who passed away. I guess it's been almost 15 years now. Um, it seems like every couple of years I write a poem about her, but this one is my favorite. I think it kind of captures something about her. Um, it's called The Road Back. All she asked for was a clean shirt and quiet and a safe place to land. All she asked for was a window overlooking a stream, some railroad tracks, or a road a stone's throw from anywhere. All she wanted was a good book like an island and a steaming bowl of rice, white clouds in the alley, white stone lifted from her mouth, a song, a boat, a way of going. All she wanted was a field and snow melt and a river and the wisdom of sparrows in the yard, their brief precarious histories like a promise no one expects to keep. And all she wanted was a clean slate of sky like a freshly washed handkerchief, a brightness she could taste on her tongue and soft dirt and a hillside and hands to let go. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for those stunning poems and also the way in which you read them. Um, that was just terrific. So, um, Next up, we have Derek Pollard. Derek is the editor of Till One Day, The Sun Shall Shine More Brightly, the poetry and prose of Donald Ravel. University of Michigan Press. He's also the author of the poetry collection On the Verge of Something Bright and Good, published by Barrow Street Press, and co-author with Derek Henderson of the poetry collection In Consequentia. Um, he serves as the series editor for Poets on Poetry series, fond founded by Donald Hall and published by the University of Michigan Press. And you can learn more about Derek at his website, um, H, which is Constellation, I'm sorry, constellarcreative.com. <laughs> Welcome, Derek. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Helen and Dr. Hine, for creating such a welcoming space for us to gather to celebrate the arts and to honor the ways in which they express and memorialize what's most meaningful in our lives. Thank you, too, to all of you who are joining us this evening and to my fellow readers who 
are making such a strong and compelling case that poetry matters. If you'll permit me, I'd like to mute my camera because I'd like to give full range to the words and the images of these poems. It is, after all, the poems that matter. And it's the poems I'd like us to be able to focus on. In celebration last month of Women in Translation and beginning next week of National Hispanic Heritage Month, I'd like to begin by reading a poem by the Dominican poet, Aida Cartagena Puerto Latin. The English translation is by Judith Kerman. The poem is entitled, How to Weep for the Death of a Rose. Of all men living, which of them knows anything? Ecclesiastes. How to weep for the death of a rose if the dawns have unfolded the world and in the grass trembling near the rose bushes, the dawns remain turned into drops of water. Only from the earth do the stars have the gleam of amber. To the bitter earth returns rain the color of rose bushes. To feel how the mosses grip the stones, there is rancor in the wandering breeze. Men have not wept for the fall of men. How to weep for the death of one rose. Hmm. This next poem is from my latest book, On the Verge of Something Bright and Good, published this summer by Barrow Street Press. For the collection's title, all credit is due to Agatha Christie, whose novel, The Moving Finger, ends with that phrase. This poem, Manhattan Still, speaks to the tragedy of 9-11 obliquely, because I have only ever been able to understand the events of that day obliquely, the senselessness, the trauma, the inhumanity. It's a poem that celebrates the city, sans doute one of the most compassionate, exhilarating, enlivening places I have ever known. Both the city I knew before and the one that has in so many ways become home to me after. Manhattan still. The way the trees are and you sitting in that booth in the Emerald Inn, apart from the traffic and the kids, still in the middle of all that noise, the booth hard as sunlight and the light itself. I felt like swinging from my own heart. The way the streets tilted up, the buildings before the buildings were no longer there. How it was just then, you with that bottle in your hand, that glass of Yalmier. And the buildings are still there, even though they're gone. This last poem, also from On the Verge, is dedicated to a poet who is always standing in long shadows. Perhaps that's why his work is as gorgeous and as deeply felt as it is. The poem is entitled, It's Spring, James Schuyler. The last of the snow surrenders the branches. Across the street, a group of kids in brightly colored t-shirts calls to us. They can't make out that we've already left. Cotton candy? 25 years ago, cotton candy might have been enough. Now, now cotton candy is simply another way of saying, you are wrong of heart. And this is who we are. And you, James Schuyler, do you believe it? it's spring? Do you love me?
Thank you so very much. What a privilege and an honor to join such a stellar group of readers on such an important evening. Thank you. So thank you, Derek. That was a wonderful reading and so many powerful poems um, and beautiful images still to talk about grief. That's hard sometimes to pull off. It's, um, I appreciate that very much. And next, I have the pleasure of introducing Ashley Jones. Um, Ashley's Poet Laureate of the state of Alabama, um, and she holds an MFA in poetry from FIU, Florida International University. Um, and she's the author of Magic City Gospel, Hub City Press, published in 2017, um, Dark Thing. Um, and most importantly, her book just came out yesterday. Um, her latest book is Reparations Now, published again through Hub City Press. Congratulations. Um, that's really terrific, Ashley. Um, her poetry has earned several awards, including, including the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, the Silver Medal and the Independent Publishers Book Awards, the Lena Miles Weaver Todd Prize for Poetry, a Literacy Fellowship from the Alabama State Council on the Arts, and the Lucille Clifton uh, Poetry Prize. She was a finalist for the Ruth Lilly Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship oh, in 2020, and her poems and essays appear or are forthcoming um, at CNN, uh, Poetry, The Oxford American, or Origins Journal, The Query by Split This Rock, Obsidian, and many, many others. She teaches creative writing um, at the Alabama School of Fine Arts and in the Low Residency MFA at Converse College. She also co-directs the Penn Birmingham, and she is the founding director of Magic City Poetry, of the Magic City Poetry. Festival. She recently served as a guest editor uh, for Poetry Magazine. Um, welcome to you, Ashley. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you to all of my fellow readers and to those who are watching as well. I'm really excited to get to read um, as a part of this reading today at the Dali Museum. I have loved Salvador Dali's work for a very long time. It has thrilled and unsettled me for many, many years. <laughs> so I'm very excited um, to read. I'd like to begin with a poem um, about 9-11. I was 11 years old when it happened. And I remember being at my middle school, um, watching on TV and not understanding really what happened at all. Um, and also being horrified at the same time. This poem that I'm gonna read is by Lucille Clifton and it's called Tuesday 9-11-01. Thunder and lightning, and our world is another place. No day will ever be the same, no blood untouched. They know this storm in other wares, Israel, Ireland, Palestine. But God has blessed America, we sing. And God has blessed America to learn that no one is exempt. The world is one, all fear is one, all life, all death, all one. So in a similar vein, I'd like to read a poem from my new book that Helen just mentioned. And this poem speaks to the idea of us all being one in our country. Unfortunately, some people believe that the South, where I'm from, is the only place where um, racism and discrimination lives. It's everywhere. Um, so this poem is called All Y'all Really From Alabama, and it begins with an epigraph from Dr. King. The straitjackets of race prejudice and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. The subtle psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror and open brutality of the South. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Why We Can't Wait. This here, the cradle of this here nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back South. Every vein filled with red dirt, blood, Cotton, we the dirty words you spit out your mouth. Mason Dixon is an imagined line. You can theorize it or wish it real. 
but it's the same old ghost, see-through, benign. All y'all from Alabama. We the wheel turning cotton to make the nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built from death. No longitude or latitude disproves the truth of founding father's sacred oath. We hold these truths like dark snuff in our jaw. Black oppressions, not happenstance, it's law. And for those keeping score, that was a sonnet. Um, no, don't, don't know if y'all heard the rhyme, but there was rhyme in there. The last poem that I'll read has to do with um, personal grief. And interestingly, I wrote this poem before the big horrible thing happened in my life. Um, I lost my dad in April of this year, which has been earth shattering and terrible and confusing in every way. But before he passed away, um, I had you know, turned 30 and I know that's not the oldest a person can be, but I had never been 30 before. So I felt very you know, new. <laughs> And I started to contemplate um, you know, my own existence. And I started to think very seriously about the fact that my parents may not exist forever. And I'm so close to my family that this was a horrifying thought for me. Um, and this thought manifested while I was on a plane on tour with my um, second book. And I just missed my family so much that I started to watch the security camera footage on my phone because I have the app connected to my parents' security camera which maybe is creepy, but that's how close we are. So I just watched all of the footage and thought, oh my gosh, my family. And so this poem, um, which is in the Huzzle form, talks about that thought process and it imagines my parents in heaven. Of course, now that's where my dad is. So it's just very interesting how poems seem to know our lives before we know them. This is called Home Security. 2,300 miles away from home, and I'm watching the tiny camera attached to the back of my parents' house. Brother dragging the black trash bin to the curb. Sisters hum to the back door with her key and bag in hand. The breaths of our quiet house. I've been thinking lately about time, how it will come for me and my family. We'll steal these bones, the flesh that guards like a house. I've been thinking about getting older, the way it seems like some years pass quick as a snap, my life between two fingers, my body, an aging house, the cracks and creaks down the halls. How did I become so old that I can start to see the end of this horizon, my mind a house full of impending pain, imminent pain? My father's face, a tomb of tears at his mother's grave. My mother's sighs to the Greensboro house, now emptied of my grandmother's body. The way a headstone smiles, come now. Did you think you'd really live forever? On the home security camera, my house looks indestructible. The cars unmoving, as if everyone has come home to stay. Looking at them walk in and out of the house, my parents and my siblings look something like strangers. How the camera's numb eye can't capture memory, just pixels and pigments. It can't keep my house from becoming a pile of wood and shingled crumb. Can't keep those living in it from dissolving into darkness, dirt, the big house I imagine as heaven. Maybe then, my angel parents wave me home from their golden porch. They say, Ashley, we've been waiting. Come on in the house. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. That was terrific, Ashley. I love, I love your line. Our poems seem to know our lives before we know them. Um, that's, that's so provocative and, and, and I think very true in some ways. So thank you, thank you for that. And, and in our Q and A, we will be talking about that cross section between public and, and private grief and how we negotiate that as poets. So um, um, thank you for that reading. Um, Hunt Hawkins. Hunt Hawkins is professor emeritus at the University of South Florida. He's the winner of the Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize 
which is a big deal. Um, and he's published a book of poems, The Domestic Life, uh, with the University of Pittsburgh Press. Um, his poems have appeared in Poetry, The Southern Review, The George Review, Triquarterly, Poet Lore, and many other journals. Thanks so much for joining us today, Hunt. Okay, thanks for including me in this event, um, which I, I think is very important. I actually knew someone who died on September 11th, Howard Kestenbaum, uh, who was in college with me. Uh, he went on and got a PhD in physics at Columbia and then became a, a professor of astrophysics. And then midlife, he decided to switch careers and uh, work for a brokerage company. And he ended up on the 103rd floor of the South Tower. Uh, and I've thought over the years, I've, I've thought of writing some poem about him. And for, but I, I know for various re reasons, I, I, I hesitated to, to do that. It seemed too intrusive somehow. And um, so I, I didn't do it, but I, I would like to remember him uh, this evening. Uh, I chose for my 9-11 poem, I, I chose one from um, Wisława Szymborska, uh, who is my favorite Polish poet. Uh, she won the Nobel Prize in 1996, but despite that, she's actually not very well known, but she, she deserves to be a lot, a lot better known than, than she is. Uh, this poem is called Photograph from September 11th. They jumped from the burning floors, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. The photograph halted them in life and now keeps them above the earth, toward the earth. Each is still complete with a particular face and blood well hidden. There's enough time for hair to come loose, for keys and coins to fall from pockets. They're still within the air's reach, within the compass of places that have just now opened. I can only do two things for them, describe this flight and not add a last line. And now I will read uh, two of my own poems. Um, and recently I've been writing a series of poems about historical events. I've been trying to think about all the problems and complications of recording and remembering events. Uh, and Szymborska's uh, poem points to just one of the many complications which is, what does it mean to end a recording of an event? Um, and these are turned out to be very difficult to write. I, I'd be happy to talk about, about that later if you, if you want. Uh, so the first one I'll read is, Daniel whipped at the market, St. Augustine, 1849. What makes memory? Tourists on trolleys are told only about Ripley's two-headed cow, the fountain of youth, Flagler's hotels, and the old open pavilion on the plaza where fish and flowers were sold. The ladies memorial auxiliary in 1872 placed on the plaza an obelisk keeping alive the names of their fallen all 46, chiseled in stone, yielding slowly to the elements, now cut in half and removed inland. 42 years before Jamestown, Admiral Pedro Menendez de Avias arrived to found America's first city, bringing Africans to cut wood, grow food, build a fort of seashells, and dump slaughtered French soldiers in the bay. Young Ralph Waldo Emerson, tubercular, came south to cure his cough and saw four children sold and bought 
without their mother. Much later, 39 lashes etched Daniel's jellied flesh, the escaped property of Antonio Burke. That's all we know. And the other and last poem is about Martin Luther King. Uh, and this poem in, with regard to the topic of memory uh, has kind of a, an opposite message from the one I just read, which encourages memory. Uh, but I think this doesn't really contradict uh, that idea. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at Santa Rita Detention Center, January 1968. People forget. Looking tired, discouraged, King stood under a cold, cloudy sky, beside barbed wire and low barracks, caging draft burners from Oakland, and spoke to a scraggly group outside the gate, a scant 200, while remembering the sunny day five years earlier, when a quarter of a million singing people crowded the mall. All lives are written on water. He had grown unpopular. Militants moved on. That farce on Washington, fiery Malcolm scorned, a picnic. Billy Graham and LBJ peeled away as he opposed Vietnam, joined civil rights with peace, and planned a poor people's campaign, Memphis only months ahead. Then he recalled his early days, unknown, the push of youth, bus boycott, the bomb on the parsonage porch, waking baby Yolanda, how a couple hundred armed supporters gathered until he said, love our enemy. Three Sundays after Santa Rita, he preached that his memorial service shouldn't mention his many awards, the recording of distinction, but only how he tried to love and serve. What can be left behind? Quoting prophet Isaiah, King asked for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Then the sky opened and a light rain fell on us all. Thank you. Thank you, Hunt, um, for that reading. I'm so glad that you read not only the Shimborski mm -hmm. poem, but with that, with that amazing last line that argues for leaving off the last line. You know, that's that's just so strong. Um, I, I I love that poem. I have read that before. Um, but also your own um, dealing with with memory and um, you know and and how to negotiate what we record in terms of history in those dark moments. So thank you for those powerful poems. Um, lastly, we have Dr. Hank Hein. Hank, thank you so much for joining us. I know you all know Hank um, as the director of the Dolly Museum, um, for which we are extremely lucky uh, to have him in that role. He's also an educator and a writer. Um, and specifically as a writer, um, he is a very fine poet. He's, he's way too modest. He's written several beautiful books. And um, thank, you, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, not only as the director of the museum, but in this situation, most importantly, as a poet. Thank you. I'm honored to be in this company. And, and Helen, thank you again for uh, your steadfastness in, in curating this marvelous program. Uh, it's been a, a boon to uh, all of us at the museum and to our community and to the community of those who um, are nourished by the thought of poetry, by the form of poetry, by the spirit of the communication that uh, flows from poetry. So I think we're, we've heard uh, a number of uh, epigraphs uh, and uh, hearing them, I decided to pull out one of my favorite by the uh, warrior soldier poet uh, Callimachus. Stranger, know that I who rest here was once a priestess of Demeter and priestess too of Kabiri 
and later also of Sibylle, that this old woman, now dust in earth, helped many through the pains of birth and bore two sons in whose arms I closed my eyes. Farewell. Pass by. <laughs> The guy who discovered titanium was a vicar poking around the soil near his church. That much trammeled grounds still held something wonderful and unknown. Though the psalms had been sung and the beds along the stone walkways planted with roses for centuries. Look, he said, a skin of this will enable God's machines to fly faster and harder to the targets of his wrath. And in the distant scream of the ordinance, the children heard, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. And this poem I've made as a kind of collage of lines from Homer. And it's called Pitiless Bronze. The son of man is a twisty thing. There are plenty of words there of every kind. The range of words is wide and their variance. Fate is the same for the man who holds back the same if he fights hard. We are all held in a single honor, the brave with the weaklings. That gall of anger that swarms like smoke inside a man's heart and becomes a thing sweeter to him by far than the dripping of honey. A man dies still if he has done nothing as one who has done much. The sort of thing you say is the thing that will be said to you. For I detest the doorways of death, and I detest that man who, and the gateways, and the long, smooth, plain, close-jointed gate timbers, a useless weight on the good land. Not the thought of my brothers who in their numbers and valor shall drop in the dust under the man, under the hands of men who hate them. We who have the same name, the same spirit, and who fell thunderously and his armor clattered upon him and his hair, lovely as the graces, was splattered with blood. Those braided locks caught wasp-wise in gold and silver. Supposing you and I, escaping this battle, would be able to live on forever, ageless, immortal, as some slip of an olive tree, strong growing that a man raises in a lonely place and drenches it with generous water so that it blossoms with beauty and the blast of winds from all quarters tremble it and bursts into pale blossoming. But then a wind suddenly in great tempest descending upon it wrenches it out of its stand and lays it at length on the ground, such, such as men are now. Since among all creatures that, that breathe on earth and crawl on it, there is not anywhere a thing more dismal than man is. Nothing is one for me now that my heart has gone through its afflictions. You are hard, you gods, and destructive. Make bright the air and give sight back to our eyes. So I think having gone through these poems that have moved us to read and to write, um, 
perhaps we could open this up to a discussion. Um, one of the things I'm made mindful of in our program is among all, all the weight and uh, burden of, of the pandemic, uh, our ability of, to let Helen reach out broadly uh, into a community of poets uh, not bound by geography has been such a blessing. And it's, it's wonderful to be with these other poets and to hear us convening on, on a single theme. Um, I wanted to see if I could direct one question to start us out. Uh, Sylvia, where you talk about the, uh, the beauty uh, in which of the, the dusty sunrise, in which the um, you know, ruin, in a sense, becomes a kind of lens. And uh, is that what we're all dealing with, the kind of uh, a new lens to see our worlds through this uh, as a response to this horrific event? Okay, yeah, that is one way to look at it. Um, it I found it, you know, incredibly ironic that here in, in the midst of, of all this destruction, um, there is beauty. So there is always um, that element in our, in our lives. Um, I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> I, I wanted to take us back to the the epigraph again. Um, we all we're all writing about error, error uh, of person to person, historical error, uh, error, error, and error of humankind. And um, but we're all forced to look at that error through the lens of the destruction those errors have called have caused. Right. So in a sense, we never can see things quite the same way after there's this kind of ruinous event. Um, if I could, um, Dr. Hine, that's, that's such a poignant question. Um, and it's, it, it, it speaks to the overwhelming complexity that we find ourselves having to contend with, right? in addressing a question as significant as that. And I might suggest that not in any way to, to overlook what occurred and what has been occurring, um, but I would suggest that perhaps one of the lenses that we now look at the world through as a result of the tragedy of 9-11 and as a result of the forever wars that it spawned, right? And all of the fallout that has been recently occurring, right? The legacy that it engendered. The pandemic too has given us the opportunity to begin to look, and I, several of you have mentioned this in your readings, to begin to look through a different lens, a lens of community, right? A lens of shared endeavor, a lens of recuperation, right? And I think that that might be one of the ways in which we find ourselves contending with the day-to-day -day in what we have through convenience become to refer to as the new normal. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, that's, those are good points. You're absolutely right, Derek. The, the, um, the need uh, for us to be brought together and using poetry in that way as a as a community um, to have you know a manner to to respond to this kind of grief and I want to say also uh, going back Sylvia to to your work and Hank's question your lens I know from your poems um, the way that you so often will use nature um, to speak to sort of the chaos of the world and. And it often has that sort of surprise and that sort of um, um, subtle way of, of showing us things that we didn't necessarily expect about ourselves. And, and your poems do it over and over again. And it's a very powerful, um, I think, typical way that you that you write that makes your poems so, um, so strong. Um, 
So I, I, I feel like you probably have a whole lot more that you that you could say. I um, mean, I love the beginning of your poem in, in that way. Um, well, yeah, and I'll throw out, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. It's interesting that you, you bring that up because um, one thing that I think 9-11 has made things different for me is that in a way I feel like uh, sometimes language fails us as poets and whether it's uh, personal or collective grief we're trying to, to address, it cannot be truly captured and uh, even understood on an emotional level. And that's something that I'm, I'm still trying to work through uh, 20 years after the fact. Absolutely. Absolutely. It brings me to the question I wanted to kind of put out for, for all of you. Um, I'm interested, you know, there, there were, as we know, thousands and thousands of poems written as a response to 9-11, many of which have been published in many books and anthologies, um, and they're still being written. Um, but I am kind of curious, and I think it's true for me, and it does get to what you just said, Sylvia, I think for some of us, the ways in which um, we write, our writing processes, possibly, possibly our content, um, may have shifted in some way as a result of 9-11, especially um, for those of us who were around at that point. I know, um, <laughs> Ashley, I know you, you were only 11, um, but some of you may have seen an article in the most recent New York Times book review about how fiction has changed since 9-11. And my question that I want to put out there is, do you think in some ways your poems may have changed? The way in which you approach poetry? Have your poems in some way changed or your writing processes, um, the way in which you try to write a poem? And, it, and if so, um, how would, would you say your, your process or some of your poems may have changed as a result of that catastrophic day? Um, well, again, I, just very briefly, I, I think Hunt said it incredibly well, um, certainly in terms of my own poetics. I, I found myself needing to write even closer to silence and to be able to honor, uh, and Sylvia, again, I think you've done a magnificent job of saying this, the ways in which language fails us. I, I think this is one of the reasons that poetry has been one of the sites to which people have turned during the past 18 months because it is a place in which our inability through language to make sense of an oftentimes senseless world is the endeavor, right? And to understand that that failure is not necessarily a failure on our part, it is encoded and embedded in the very language that we use and to be able to acknowledge the fact that our ability to communicate is always already limited right can only ever take us so far i think gives us so many opportunities getting back dr hind to what you had said to think about the lenses through which we are looking at the world and to me this is one of the great richnesses and one of the gifts that the arts give us they provoke us in meaningful, substantive, compassionate ways to find our way to dialogue that might otherwise elude us, knowing that we are always not going to be able, Sylvia, as you had said, to say it exactly as we mean it. Hunt or Ashley, would you like to add to that in some way? Um, well, I just, as you said, I was um, pretty young when 9-11 happened. But I had already been writing poetry. Um, I started pretty early. Um, but I think maybe the way that um, my poet poetic life has been colored by 9-11 um, is that I think for me, poetry, it's, it's never been a question um, whether or not poetry could talk about these difficult topics, talk about political issues. Um, perhaps because I grew up or I came into my poetry voice after that time, um, but there wasn't this sort of battle between poets who wanted to write and play with language for the sake of language and poets who wanted to talk about the but um, I mean, that, that battle existed, but I think it was easier for me growing up in the time period um, to come to poetry and expect it to do what Derek has just described to help me process 
um, difficult events and to help me to, to understand the country in which I live um, as well. So perhaps because I grew up in this post 9-11 world, I was able to really become the political poet that I am um, maybe a little more easily. Hank, any, any thoughts? Uh, well, I'm too old to have changed the way I approach things. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that we have before us a question, though, about, and, and it's a question of poetry as well as a question of living, and that is, you know, do we begin with the particular or do we begin with the, the general? And uh, that, you know, the poem that Derek read about the inability to approach the um, the death of a rose because we, we don't know how to really approach responsibly the death of our fellows um, you know, asks us, um, it states that um, there <clears throat> it'll be very difficult to work to the general from the particular because the the general is is looming there as of an immense failure and the the poem that Ashley read as well which is that there I mean in a sense she's saying that poet is saying there isn't a 9-11 there's a, a little tiny 9-11 which is part of this immense history of wrongdoing violence and um, egregious behavior so where do you start and and you know I always felt that um, I always felt that 9-11 would recalibrate us a little bit. I thought, you know, after 9-11, there are not going to be any more gratuitous uh, movies about military heroes, you know, Rambo and things like that. People are going to be chastened and understand that life is, is precious and that violence is not a joke. Guess what? It just... It, erupted in violence within a couple of years. Now we see the most horrific things in films and uh, novels and poetry. <laughs> and so um, I think that what we should be as human beings is chastened by prejudice, by suffering, by violence, by every form of misery, whether man-induced or by the gods, and to try to be as delicate and as particular in our perceptions and dealings with one another as possible. So I think we have to address the death of a rose, but not to the extent that we do not look at other things more important. Thank you, Derek. Um, I, mean, I would say for myself, when I did try to write the 9-11 poem, I, I went through a pretty long time of not being able to write um, certainly a poem about 9-11, but really any any poetry um, for a while after that event. So I, I did feel um, something deep. It almost felt like really my only written response could be a period. Um, you know, it was just that shattering for me. Um, and, um, and, and I do think it certainly gave me more feelings of uncertainty and dread and you know and, and all of that which which if i were to to look at my poems I, I think maybe or maybe i just want to believe this that i i feel like with my writing i am less likely to write with as strong a certainty as i did when i was younger because nothing about the world seemed certain anymore uh, for me after 9 11. so i i think earlier in my more optimistic days, I, um, I I would have a tendency sometimes to fall into that. And my very good graduate professor, Hunt Hawkins, used to sometimes remind me of that. Um, and, um, you know, because of course, if you write with certainty, you tend to be too didactic, and it's something you want to avoid. Um, and, and I think, um, I do think I shifted with that, because all of a sudden, um, there, you know, I, I was disillusioned, everything there is a sort of loss of innocence that to me translated into my poems as writing, I believe, with a little less certainty and which I think gets back again um, to the poem um, that you read, Hank, um, by Jim Borsk about leaving off that last line, you know, so anyway, it, it's interesting. It's a, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I, I will follow up and agree with what Hank said as, 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 as an older person here. 
Um, <laughs> not to diminish 9-11 in any way, but there was just a huge catalog of disasters that have occurred uh, during during my lifetime. Uh, the, uh, Parkland, Sandy Hook, George Floyd, Dr. King, uh, Megger Evers, Bobby Kennedy. It, 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 you know, there's been a very long series of, 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 of traumas and you can go back even farther to uh, Wounded Knee and Sharpville and, and, and the Maji Maji Rebellion and the Ghost Dances and the there's just a, a, a huge list of, of, of these things. And then as, as a poet, if you're trying to deal with it, I, I think you, know, you need to, to understand, you know, try to understand all these events as, as best you can to think of, of whether humanity is just hopelessly broken or, or, or whether there's possibilities of, 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 of hope uh, it, you should I think you should try to memorialize things uh, although you can go too far with memorialization uh, Santiago said those who forget history are condemned to repeat it but if you look at Northern Ireland and the orange men marking <laughs> every every year celebrating the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, uh, people who remember history are also condemned to repeat it. Uh, so you've got to you've got to try to sort through that. Um, what what impressed me so much about Dr. King, which I which I hadn't really known until I, I started researching that 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 poem, was that he said that. Personally, uh, he he wasn't interested in people remembering him. Uh, and his drum his drum major sort of, um, he said that. And and that what what's important is just to try to do some good in the world and not not try to be remembered. So so simultaneously, you need to remember things, but also not necessarily try to make yourself the center of, of memory. Uh, Derek, I noticed in the background you have a, a service flag. Do you mind telling us about that? Yeah, my grandfather was a Navy CB in World War II. Uh, he lived to be 99 years old, passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, is in rest at the... Uh, uh, VA Center in St. Petersburg, Bay Pines. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it, it um, is a very meaningful segue to me um, to connecting with my own personal history with the Dali. And I know, Ashley, you and I have talked about this and you have written so courageously in your introductions to uh, the issues of Poetry Magazine that you have uh, uh, been able to give us and, and, and uh, bring together for us family uh, is, is just profoundly important. And I think that this speaks to so many points that each of you have raised. Um, I first found my way to the Dali uh, before it was moved into its new building, uh, which is absolutely extraordinary. I cannot say how much that building inspires me every time that I'm in it. And uh, I wanna thank you for providing not just the community of uh, Central Florida and the Gulf Coast, but the entire world with a, a leading museum and organization. Um, I had the great good fortune to attend the Van Gogh exhibit recently. Uh, it was my first event outside of the home since the pandemic uh, in public. And I was in tears throughout. I attended with my younger sister um, who lives in Tarpon Springs. And it was one of the most transformative experiences that I've had as a lifelong museum goer. My first experience at the Dali was with my paternal grandmother um, who accompanied me, um, had such a profound curiosity um, as my grandfather sat in the car. Um, my grandmother uh, 
accompanied me into the museum and we wended our way through what I thought was going to be uh, a, a, an exhibition space that was going to challenge her profoundly. She had such an extraordinary time. And in fact, um, she bought from the gift shop a coffee mug that I just this morning had my tea out of. So, <laughs> um, but yes, I just, uh, you know, again, speaking to this, speaking to the personal and the public, speaking to grief and loss, one of the things I think we have to acknowledge is, is that, and I, I just so appreciate this. I mean, I, you know, that the emphasis that we place upon not only compassion, but humility. And I know we say it all the time, right? It's the poems that matter, right? Um, I just think it's increasingly important that we give credence to that and abide it because that's, this is one of the spaces in which for me, dialogue is still possible regardless of who you are, where you come from, what your background is, what your ideology is. The arts promote the types of conversations that quite often people are not comfortable having in other contexts. And to be able to connect that with life going on, right, which it does, right? And Ashley, I think the, the poem in, in your preface to the poem about family and loss was so deeply resonant to me because as you see, my grandfather and my grandmother are still very much with me, even though they are gone. And I think that that's one of those places in which poetry and the arts sustains us, continues to inspire us, and continues to, to create the space for the types of conversations that are going to change the world. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge Auden's claim, right? Poetry makes nothing happen, but we make sure that we understand the full context, right? And we actually read past, right? Because that's just part of that line, right? There's more to it. And it has to do with poetry engendering a sense of moving forward. Thank you so much for that question, by the way. I really appreciate it. And, and Derek, just to elaborate on that very moving point about what poetry can do, I think that uh, poetry in a sense plays the same role as in Ashley's poem, the parents saying, come on in. And in Helen's poem, the father's waiting arms for he who jumps. We hope it is so. Yep. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up Auden because I think one of the most published poems after 9-11 um, was W.H. Auden's poem, September 1, 1939, uh, which was written, of course, about World War II and the invasion of Germany. And it's, it is a powerful poem, but that poem was reprinted all over um, in so many newspapers and magazines because it seemed to speak to the horrific situation of 9-11. And, um, but interestingly enough, and this does kind of lead into a, a, another question that I, that I wanted to put out there, um, at some point, it, Auden disavowed that poem. And I think he was frustrated that it was so wildly popular. And he, um, I, I may not have the exact line down and, and correct me if anybody knows it, but I think that the line that he had the most trouble with was his line, something like we love or we die and he actually tried to change that to we love and we die um but people would have none of that um and what insisted on keeping it the same but his feeling was it wasn't honest that wasn't true because of course even if we love we do still die you know um but my question um is if we choose or when we choose to address grief in our work whether it's a personal grief um whether it's a grief uh, because of racism or I mean, the, the many things that we've talked about here this evening, um, in addition to if it's a, um, a grief of the magnitude of 9-11, how do we do that as poets? One, without seeming didactic or using too many cliches, what do we use? What do we, how do we try to avoid that? Or, or two, how do we avoid um, allowing our images to almost exploit the victim? Um, you know, putting it out there as for kind of human consumption, if you will. So can we talk a little bit about that? How, if we choose and when we choose to write about grief, whether private or public, are there ways that you think of in your own poems um, that you try to potentially guard against those, um, those things? Uh, cliche or again, 
making the victim more consumerized during the trade. Thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think there are many strategies, but one strategy that has worked for me, or at least I hope it has worked um, for me, is to utilize form and the way that the poem looks on the page to reel myself in. So um, with the poem, one of the poem, both poems actually that I read of my own are in different forms. One is a sonnet and one is the huzzle form. And I find that when I have a topic that's so big, either in feeling or in magnitude, that I know I'm just going to kind of ramble, for lack of a better word, ramble through with my emotions and myself, I guess, becoming the most important thing, which I am not in either of these, um, either of these poems. I try to utilize a form that will make me um, kind of not trap myself, but say with the sonnet, I know that I only have 14. I have to really choose what I say. I know that I need to look at my syllable. I have to really figure out if each word is communicating what needs to be communicated. And with the hustle as well, the repeated phrase is so important. And in some ways, when there's a form that's um, repetitive like that, it will take you on a journey that you, you did not expect. And usually it will leave you in the dust and let the idea actually live and breathe. So that's, that's one um, strategy. I love that. I love that. And I had noticed that with the sonnet. In addition to the idea of form being a compression of emotion, so if there is something like grief that you're dealing with, that compression alone can give power to your words and power to the poem. I'm so glad you, you mentioned that. You're absolutely right. Anybody else? Um, I always find that the, the best way for me to approach something like that is to just start really small, you know, an image, a tiny image of a, a leaf on the ground, a color, um, you know, a voice calling in the street and just taking it from there. Um, many times I'm act I've actually started a poem without, without having any idea of what I'm going to be writing about and then it turns into, into a, a piece of something of greater magnitude. But that's, that's what I find to, to be the easiest. For me. Well, and I, 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 that, again, that really resonates with me, honoring the smallness of those individual moments. And Dr. Heinous gets back to one of the points that you were making, right? That, that That is the place in which these poems begin to speak for themselves without, Helen, as you were suggesting, appropriating or commodifying grief and loss. And Sylvia, I just, I, I, it, that to me is such an incredibly significant move that you're making in your writing, honoring the smallness of each of those moments and letting that lead you as opposed to trying to impose the order, the structure, the direction. It's listening that deeply and that closely so that the events begin to propel the poem. And Ashley, as you had suggested, that really is the point at which the poem begins to write itself. And we simply become a sort of witness to that process. Right. And I think that that, again, that winds up, those wind up being the poems that we gravitate toward, because I, I feel as though all, that is an intangible and something that is that is extremely difficult, if not nigh on impossible to convey that sense of purpose, particularly if it is the poem's purpose that is driving you becomes evident. Right. And as a reader, those are the poems I, I think that over and again we gravitate toward because they're honoring, they're listening, and that's what's propelling them forward as opposed to, Helen, you had mentioned this, a sort of imposition of order, right? Or a sense of commanding the poem, commanding the language. If we start to get out of language's way, it's astonishing what winds up happening, right? To us as readers, to us as writers as well. Any other thoughts or questions that we want to put out there about about this uh, about this topic about writing grief, uh, public grief, private grief? Um, going back to on for a moment, uh, the uh, the rest of the line is poetry makes nothing happening 
uh, it, it, it is a it is a way of happening a mouth, and and the, and the topic of the poem is 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 uh, the death of William Butler Yeats, uh, and William Yeats is first received an honor guest William Yeats is laid to rest. Uh, so it's a poem that it, it, it is a poem about grief and and, and remembering things. Um, the, qu the question you raise, Helen, is one that I've wrestled with a lot of, of, of trying to trying to talk about other people and who, who can speak for whom and what, what right you have to, to, to do that. And I, I mentioned I, you know, I, somehow I felt uncomfortable trying to write about Howard Kestenbaum dying on on 9/11 on because you know I I just didn't feel that I had <laughs> I had enough uh, knowledge and connection and, uh, and, and to, to to do a good job with it uh, I but I have you know I have written about I wrote about Dr. Dr. King I've, I I knew Eduardo Mondalon who was the head of Trolimo and was was killed by the Portuguese secret police uh, in, in Dar es Salaam when I was there, um, and I don't know. You have to, you have to, you have to believe that literature has some power of, of, of understanding and 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 some power of imagination, so that you can kind of project yourself into the situation of, of other people. Uh, but you have to do it with a certain modesty and, and not really think that you can, you know, that you have the last word about things. Exactly. So that's, that, that's my small bit of wisdom. Right, right. Yeah, and I think, I think Auden talked about how what poetry does is it does make us more human. It does bring us together. It allows us to feel more human collectively together. And, and I... I think that's um, absolutely, um, absolutely true, um, with all of its limitations and all of its possibilities. That, that human connection. Um, and then one last thought I want to leave us with: uh, again, the article in the New York Times Book Review mentioned that 9/11 was the first public event um, that connected the world through technology. Which I thought was interesting. I'd never thought about that before. That it was the very first public event where the whole world was connected through technology. And, you know, to think about how technology has entered into it, the way in which we write poems and, and um, uh, the way in which we research our poems, the way in which we read, uh, you know, voices that we may not have otherwise found. Um, I think there are some profound ways in which technology has, um, has broadened our role as poets and our experience um, of reading poetry. And I, I, th I think that's no small thing, especially to the extent to which it does encourage us um, to broaden the canon and, and be more inclusive. Well, and, and I just want to say again, I know this is a point Helen and, and Dr. Hine, you had brought up earlier. Um, our, our reading this evening is in fact an example of this. And I so applaud the Dali and other cultural venues who are committed to continuing to build community by creating space, right? I mean, we have the opportunity to connect with one another. I know we are all so fatigued by Zoom, but what an extraordinary opportunity for us to be able to have these types of conversations and events. So I just wanna thank both of you again and all of the people, Joy as well, for all of your excellent production work this evening who are continuing to commit to being able to create spaces such as this so that we can continue to have these types of experiences. So bravo to the Dali for continuing to reach out, right, in this incredibly profound way and use these technologies as a further bridge. I, I just, that thrills me, the opportunity to be able to get together with such an incredible group of people and all of you who have joined us to be able to talk about something that clearly is at the heart of our daily lives. Thank you, Derek. 
And, and thanks to all of you all for, for joining us. Um, we couldn't have done the program with, without the poets. We appreciate it so much that you've joined us here today. And um, we could talk about these issues for a long time. The fact that we are poets, I guess, still says we really do believe poetry matters. <laughs> and we're counting on it. And, um, um, and we thank all of you for, for joining the Dolly Poetry Series this evening. Um, come back, if you will, next week. Please let your friends know, even if they couldn't tune in um, for our premiere, um, the program will stay up on our Dali uh, uh, YouTube channel. And so you may come back anytime to visit, that you will. Until our next program, please um, stay safe um, and connected to all those you love. Thanks again for joining us. Bye. Bye.